I'm here to talk about sense-sensitive design and the working and environment. Um, an inspiring, this is a statement, I won't read it to you, an inspiring <coughs> uh, working environment is one that I feel is sensitive choreographed. Um, there's plenty of evidence, wonderful evidence-based research that uh, underpins some of this uh, in terms of creating um, better well-being um, and in indeed increasing productivity. Before I go anywhere, uh, I always like to go back to basics. Um, how, do we how do we experience our environment? We do so by our senses, our sensory receptors. Um, we're familiar with five of them. Some of you might know one or two more. I mean, I, I'm sure we all do. A uh, sense of balance uh, and a uh, uh, sense of pain even, sense of time and space. There are one or two more exotic ones like proprioception, kinesthesia and so forth. And in a very simplistic way, we understand our environment through our sensory receptors. That information is sent to the hypothalamus, which then orchestrates a cascade of hormones through the body in terms of melatonins, noradrenalines, um, cortisols and so on. At this time of night, our sense of smell is heightened more than ever. Um, melatonin is beginning to set in. I hope none of you are going to fall asleep <laughs> during the, our presentation. Um, and all sorts of exciting things begin to determine the way we feel within the space. And Diane quite rightly identified that we have four generations that live in these working environments. And we have to understand and begin to understand how these senses begin to mature so that we can make the correct design interventions. So these are a few of those uh, senses that we were talking about. Um, and I'll come to each of them individually. And I'll go to uh, the way doctors diagnose all of us. They normally relate to three body systems. And these are they, uh, the autonomic system, the motor system, and the state system. So in terms of the autonomic system, that relates to breathing and respiration. So you can imagine as one gets older, one gets more of a compromised cardiovascular system. Noise begins to create uh, stress, increases systolic rate and so on. So it's important to recognize this. We'll show you how we have actually introduced that in a spreadsheet of ours. So how do we see? We see, we all see in different ways. So we've got four generations um, as we get older, begin to wear bifocal lenses. Um, the lens, our lenses get, the cornea gets a little bit thicker. Uh, in fact, a 60 year old will see 25% less daylight than a 20 year old will do so. So think about those sorts of design interventions. Um, so we look at light, we look at light, color, Light comes in as natural light and artificial light. And there's, I've identified pieces of relevant research on the bottom of most of these slides, and there are many more of them. But daylight falls under two categories, mainly uh, natural light and artificial light. And light is of great benefit um, in our environments, and it's good that we actually punch as much of it into the workplace. There's some wonderful evidence that shows how productivity increases in schools. There are lots of compelling pieces of research that show that exam results uh, are heightened by uh, introducing either full spectrum lighting or um, placing pupils in highly lit uh, environments. Daylight delivers uh, serotonin, a feel-good drug, uh, de de uh, delivers vitamin D, but it also metabolizes many other um, phosphates and um, proteins and vitamins as well. So it, it is of great benefit to make sure that we actually get plenty of that daylight into the space in terms of very simple productivity as well and well-being. I mean, 
these are mustard seeds and pumpkin seeds. Um, a piece of research that was conducted at Freiburg University with Iguzzini. And those are spectral biased light fittings, red and pinks and so on. And this is what it does to mustard seeds and pumpkin seeds. Sorry. We conduct uh, natural light. The amazing thing about natural light is that um, it is about 10 to 100,000 lux that is out there. In this space at present, we're probably looking at something like 700 lux. So it's quite frightening. We, we accommodate scenarios, and that's what our problem is, by and large. We accommodate. It's the Boyle's frog syndrome. You know, we adapt and adapt unt until we nearly perish. <laughs> Uh, the amazing thing is we've got, I've got blue light calms aggressive behavior. Interestingly enough, research shows that the more light we have in an environment, the more active we are. We also suffer from a little bit of a burnout, or other like taking sugar. The more we have, you actually get this sort of peak and drop. But more recently, research has shown that a blue spectral range of light fittings increases productivity. In fact, Surrey University have conducted quite a lot of research on this, and so have Philips, and we have an active Eva light uh, that's been produced that I think they maintain that we have something like 18, 20% extra productivity under that particular light. And more recently, um, we're all familiar with this cross-section of the eye, the rods and the cones. More recently, um, I think it was two three years ago, discovered a photoreceptor um, at the front here that doesn't pick up any images, upside down images or any color, but it picks up diurnal cycles, which recalibrate your circadian clocks. I mean, I just touched on circadian clocks. These are little clocks that tell you you're hungry, that you should go to bed, you should go to sleep, you should do certain postprandial drop, all of these things, and you need that, that is absolutely vital. And here, and I'll come back to this, these are some of the cycles, the cortisol cycles, the melatonin cycles, and interestingly enough, the body temperature as well as alertness cycles over two days. I think this repeats. I've got plenty of material, so I'm going to skate <laughs> on a little bit, and we can come back to a lot of this. Oh, this, slowly. yeah. Sorry, <laughs> this is a lot. This is essentially what's actually happening while we've been actually here. So sort of daylight, these are the levels, 100,000, 10,000 lux. And this is our centering evening to moonlight scenarios. And these are some of the effects of uh, light in terms of percep perception, performance, moods, emotions, and so forth. And this is a really elegant, um, Heliobus some pipe, and I think some one or two uh, products are being sold now, uh, which are less expensive in the UK now. But this is an elegant way of actually delivering daylight, that 10,000 to 100,000 likes into the center of your office space. We've actually done it in radio diagnostic imaging spaces where you just can't possibly conceive of actually having any windows in, in those bastions. Sorry. We also have a look, we've had a look in past work with, Philip, uh, with Philips uh, and Iguzzini in developing biodynamic lighting, which is essentially mimics diurnal cycles, which are really important as well. It's not just having so many lux coming into the space, but the cognizance, which goes back to that third receptor of the night and day cycle. So they've actually developed, and originally, amazingly, they developed it for um, office environments. Um, but I remember ringing them up and telling them, look, this is brilliant in ITUs and theatres and other settings. In fact, they're using it for coma patients to get them into that rhythm and then out of that rhythm as well. And you can mimic just any day, a day in Oslo, a day in Glasgow, London, <laughs> or Reykjavik. Um, ah. 
these things. So, um, we come to colour. These are all chapters under the heading of sight. So we've had uh, light, so we're coming on to colour. And amazingly, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, there are only 11 words that define all of the colours that exist. Blue, green, red, and they go up to some, uh, that many words will describe all of the colours that exist. Whereas on a computer, you can pull out something like 16 million <laughs> colours, and the eyes can actually see well beyond that. And it's amazing that what you can actually do in terms of colour within the workplace, um, and how destructive certain colours can be. I read, as I prepared some of this material, I read more and more research that showed you how greys and whites are really destructive in terms of productivity and errors in terms of errors, numeration, uh, quantities of errors, accountants, making more and more mistakes within those settings. Um, people like Mankey, Frank Mankey. Uh, research comes mostly from Biron, Mankey, uh, Moss and one or two others um, that really begin to define some of the colours, the appropriate colours in the spaces. Uh, so colour affects us. The amazing thing about colour, there's more and more research that comes to the fore, how colour, certain colours can affect your perception of time in a waiting area, in any space. It's, and you'll be surprised at some of the results, and I won't go into them, but how reds and blues affect your perception of time. You can actually squeeze, you can make people walk through corridors quicker, you can slow people down, you can take ceilings down, you can do all sorts of things in terms, in terms of colour. And there's some lovely, delicious pieces of research that relate to that. Um, one that I particularly like at the moment is temperature, how you can actually, we have issues, and I'll come to touch, to the tactile sense. Um, and how we all suffer from living in the same temperature. And with all of the uh, uh, gender issues of girls liking it hotter than guys and the rest of it, and not being able to control the open plan of offices. And temperature can be controlled by using color in some of the corrals, some of the, so your perception of certain colors can uh, drop or increase by two to four to six percent within any spaces. I want, these are just one or two repetitive slides. Then we come on to views. There's, and that's quite important again, under sight, views, vistas. There's lots of compelling uh, evidence out there in terms of, and some of it's fairly pivotal from Roger Ulrich to people like Joe Fisher, who tell us that within three minutes of actually viewing trees, uh, your systolic rate, diastolic rate reduces, respiration rate drops. Um, and that's fairly important. And I couldn't believe it because I was engaged in healthcare and mental health. How much of this research has actually been done in office settings? In fact, what we've discovered, even names by Philip, in fact, I'll come to it, um, they're, they're one or two pieces of research that actually identify ways of introducing just si simple pictures within a space. I know some of it's a bit tacky, but, uh, and we want the real thing, but um, it's amazing how much proof and evidence there is, and it's continuing. People like, in fact, interestingly enough, I've got Skylab there. One of the missions was nearly aborted. All of the body system were were measured constantly from NASA, but the portholes were too tiny on this, on this particular skyline. There's a whole chapter just on that, on one of the NASA books, which is amazing. Um, Sorry. Sorry. <coughs> the view. Walk, walking outside is better. If you, walk, if you went outside here, for instance, it wouldn't be as good as walking out as far as Regent's Park or somewhere. But the actual countryside around you yeah, it's the, it's the countryside. It's that link to mostly to it's trees. Huh? It's astonishing. It is. It is absolutely. In fact, I could. People have to stop me talking on any of these things because I get so excited. There's a there's a lovely piece of research in Japan that shows you. It's the type of trees that you view as well, has an effect on your brain will produce alpha waves or beta waves. So if you've got a, a canopy, wider canopy, the brain produces 
beta waves, but that's interesting in itself because it's a calming aspect of um, just having horizontal lines within a space. Brain produces uh, alpha waves, which are calming in themselves. So in terms of design, it's a useful thing to remember, but in terms of tree canopy or Lombardy poplar, yes, I'd better continue, otherwise <laughs> I'm going to be... Um, so, so these are names that I never knew of, biophilic design biomimicry design. Uh, these are linkages. I think the, they all relate to us linking with nature. It's not just trees, but it's also uh, animals and beyond. And I think one of the important things that we've actually found in past in, in designing some of our hospitals and some of our spaces and office spaces is trying to get that permeability through space. So you have to be a real interior designer. You have to, in fact, in Japan, they landscape outside and beyond from the inside. They don't do what some of us architects do through from 6,000 feet up. We do, oh, we'll have a lake here and a few trees here. But they, it's really important that you see well beyond. And then you can create that permeability. And that's important in the office environment because so many of the corrals and so, much, so many of the spaces can start to tighten you in and contract and then you'll see some of these you can create them in all sorts of ways in terms of some of them are a little bit tacky we've used webcams real time cctv cameras monitoring trust land so lakes ponds nest nesting geese or whatever um, and you can see some of these environments then we come to sound sound and here, there's a wagon load, a Euro truck, many Euro trucks of research that relate to sound <laughs> and how that impacts us all. Um, and I found pieces of odd eclectic. It's quite nice coming in sideways into office environments from health, with a healthcare background. Is I did know, for instance, that uh, noise, which is aggressive sound, can increase cholesterol levels. Did you know that? I didn't know that. That was wonderful. There were two pieces of research that related to that. But the sonic environment is absolutely critical and it's, one of, it's pivotal to all uh, environments. And that's why we have all of the problems that we have with open plan schools, open plan uh, offices. In fact, we know that we need open plan spaces for to create the flexibility, the agility and all of the things that we want, we need to do it and create it, and that's another issue. But we also have the issue, the sonic environment, the issue of that sound trespassing the different spaces and so on. Um, I won't go through all of them. I think they're all uh, self-evident. And again, the important thing on sound, again, if you go physiologically, it's the body just begins to create more cortisol, more adrenaline, fight and flight mode it gets into, so it creates, and that's a constant tension that's there. And interestingly enough, there's a chapter that I haven't got here, and it's in the oven at the moment. <laughs> it's called wireless sensitivity, electrosensitivity, and I've actually presented bits of this because this has been an ongoing um, project in collating this information. Notice lots of interior designers and people working in the offices actually hearing things that I don't hear, um, just like a, a background noise that's generated by computers and so on. And some have actually said that it's actually detrimental and they actually have to go home. So we're talking about staff turnover. It's something invisible. Again, it's sort of, I'm finding that as I get more and more into my career, it's the invisible bits of architecture that are almost more important, the things that knock around, the smells, the pathogens, the CO2, the lack of oxygen. All of these things are really impacting us. It's not the, it's not the wall being there. It's the invisible bits become more and more important. Anyway, I'm wittering on a bit. Um, sound. Um, sound has an effect on, we mentioned some of the body systems, the autonomic system, the limbic system, which is the emotional core uh, within the uh, hypothalamus, systolic rate, diastolic rate, respiration rate, and so on. And then cholesterol levels as well, remarkably. And I must admit, out of the plethora, and there's so much of it to read, uh, this I found one of the most compelling pieces of research. It's just uh, from DeMarco Lister, 1985. It just shows you how 
um, just changing the immediate environment, sonic environment around you can actually do this sort of damage. Just changing from bottom 25 percentile that you see to the top percentile, just that by making some of these changes, diverting calls, just empowering. We were talking about the power of em empowerment, moving things around. And then, of course, often forgotten, are the nice sounds. The sounds that release serotonin and make you feel good. I mean, obviously, we can introduce these in different ways into the workplace, but you can start off by introducing things like white noise or even pink noise uh, that begins to mask some of, the, um, some of the real issues in terms of background. I mean, if you just stand still here quietly a moment, you can actually hear a little bit of traffic and you can hear the fan and all sorts of other things uh, happening. But you can have more aggressive scenarios there where it's useful to introduce sound, to mask sound. And these are all wonderful ways of actually beginning to introduce sound. And you can do that by landscaping immediately in and around building. Certain, pl certain plants specified will introduce certain insects, will introduce certain birds or so forth. And then this is, these are all huge in their own right. Sense of, sense of space. Where, where does one begin? I've just listed things that I know about. Proxemics, the human bubble, how bubbles intersect, how I create tension if I sit closer and closer. And I've seen, I've seen plans where literally the people are almost sitting on top of each other. There is, there is, they're well into each other's <laughs> bubbles. But territorialism, and I think, Dan, you, me you mentioned about some of these boundaries and a defensible space, and you're quite right. It's the number of tiles. It's, you know, it's your seniority is the number of tiles. If I have 20 Fisher tiles, <laughs> that's, oh, wow, that's, you're really, you're really doing well. You're going stratospheric. Um, but th th this is important in terms of, in fact, I'll come to it, yeah. We talk about cellular open plan, that's bureau landscape, hot desking. It's always an issue. How, how are we going to resolve that? About the hive, the den, the cell, and then that's a way DGW began to identify you know, the uh, call center, which was the hive, smaller little cells. They all have to exist in one way or the other. It depends on what our tasks are and what our jobs are. Uh, it depends on flexibility um, and how we can actually change space really quickly. And this, this, was, this will amuse you. We clearly talk about telework and there all, there's all sorts of terms that will talk about uh, digital nomads, mm -hmm. uh, workplacelessness, uh, <laughs> telework. And then we've, thought, and then we've started looking at how do we work? We work at home and uh, T.P. Bennett will say we work in telephone boxes as well. And uh, that's uh, when I thought of you, Paige reading Diane's book in the bath <laughs> and she dropped the book in the bath <laughs> she had to tell me that so she's actually working in a bath in her little bubble which was the confines of that space <laughs> but then we come on to space and there's some lovely images of how you can actually climb out of your space it's quite evident that for different tasks, we need different levels of engagement, one-to-one, -one, just as you do with the proxemics thing. You need intimate space, you need private space, you need social space, you need public space, so depending on what your activity is. This is a lovely one. This is almost uterine, sort of, it's a lovely place to disappear into. I think uh, Buckminster Fuller, I haven't got that image here, it's got these big but when it's a sort of sleeping bags that you put over your head and you just fall asleep over your desk. Have you seen that? Yeah, you have seen them. And there's another one that is just, it's just like a big sock that covers you so you can actually disappear even if you snore. But you're, you're within your own bubble and you're healing as well. And you're, you are... Sorry. And obviously with all of these spaces we start to have, we start to introduce, uh, we need... Um, safety valves and these are some of those safety valves and we've been involved in actually developing one or two of them. We've worked with Avea and 
Oculus on a couple of these. These are sleep pods that do other things. I'm not sure how much time I've got, but I'm going to move a little bit faster. This looks a bit like a Breville, a toaster. I'm not <laughs> quite sure. I'm sure they're having a bit of a fun time there. But it is vital to do that. And there is research. I haven't got it on this particular slide that shows you. And in fact, even more recently on schools as well, just having a small amount of postprandial drop just improves, improves learning capacity. So in schools, for instance, literacy and numeracy is taught in the morning, but not in the afternoon. Now they're able to do that by just introducing cat naps, which they do in Europe, and they're talking about that in the office uh, setting as well. So we have to create the space to do exactly that. Proprioception, kinesthesia, really, all of this really relates to ergonomics, and we're all familiar with all of these things. But the important thing to remind ourselves about is, is what we were talking about, the four generations. So. How does that look? How does the fly chair cope with uh, a baby boomer or you know, suffering from arthritis? Or, or you know, people are, are also beginning to talk because we're talking about lots of bariatric people that are growing laterally because they spend too many, time, too many hours working and sitting in front of a TV. So there's a lot of a, a great move in ch changing the furniture so people actually stand up at their, in fact, there, there's a group that's actually developed uh, exactly that, even a conference table, so you can actually stand or sit, so you're actually burning calories while you're actually discussing uh, matters. Oh, this, this, this is obviously in his blog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these are typical, I won't go through all of these. This is an interesting one, this is touch. Um, we all have, it's a confirmatory sense, it confirms that I am here, it confirms all of the other things that the other senses are telling you, there's a chair there, so, but it's a, it's a really vital one, and I'll come to it in terms of, we all have something, on average, something like 1.75 square meters of skin, which will cover a door, basically, and with all of that, we touch, we don't only touch with the end of our fingers, we touch with all of our, our body, so, Things like temperature, something I mentioned before. Uh, I'll come to that, I've just mentioned that. But things like temperature are really vital. Um, amazingly, there's, when we feel that, we're feeling that here. They're, they're hot spots, they're sweet spots in terms of productivity, which vary from something like 20 to 22 degrees. And they're huge variables, and there's some here. And one of the important ones, and interestingly enough, uh, when we were looking at uh, our body cycles, our circadian clocks, we are also looking at body temperature. And that's not often tracked there. And also, and you can actually see how it actually drops off um, after midnight down through helping sleep. But the important one is also alertness. And we'll come to that in a moment as well. And this is... <coughs> This is a typical one. I love this because this is so typical of our office. It's just endless, endless problems between <laughs> the guys, guys feeling too hot and the girls feeling too cold and inevitably. But how do we deal with that? Again, open plan seems to be the answer. And I think part of the secret is to do with color as well. There are one or two things that you can actually do in terms of color. And we've actually been trialing some of this out, but you can actually see productivity dropping, some studies showing how productivity drops just by that temperature differential. And I think we talked about time. Time comes in all sorts of, uh, and I think our next speaker is going to talk about time, so I'm not going to steal too much of his thunder, but it comes in many guises, uh, time, more than ever. Um, I go back to looking at the circadian clocks, which is really important and how the day changes um, from hour to hour and how we can actually um, help that along with one or two design interventions. So we have, we can list some of the, um, the issues there. I'll skate through some of these. These are very typical, but the solutions are, I mean, we're, with Paul, for instance, we've actually been working on a job in Vancouver, and we literally have been working 24-7. 
our day normally, we all go to sleep at the same time roughly. Emails sort of fall away by the evening and you're not expected. By the time you go get up in the morning, go to your computer, there are few emails there. But with us, was, we finished our day and theirs began. And all you could hear all night long was ping, 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 emails in response to, and you have to deal with it. So you, there is nowhere to go sometimes. Um, it has to do with sleep deprivation. Here, amazingly, I've got smell. Not many people, I'm sure, have talked about smell in the office environment. But um, that has, has had, and amazingly, there's some really interesting pieces of research that relate to exactly that and how that can actually cause problems within the spaces. But interestingly enough, there's no unit of measurement in terms of smell, um, apart from these old ones that, that we have here, uh, which cite things like burnt match or wet dog. Uh, but interestingly enough, this year, two scientists have won the Nobel Prize and they've defined 10 types of smell. They've started to categorize all of this. But these really cause problems, can cause problems, but you can actually use them here. And I went to uh, these headquarters, the Kojima headquarters. They are contractors in Tokyo. Uh, they, they coupled up with Shiseido, uh, perfume manufacturer. And basically early in the morning, they release citrus smells into that space, then floral smells to aid concentration, woodland smell. And then when you get your postprandial drop, we're becoming less effective. Um, citrus smells come into play. In fact, we, we've, actually started, we've actually conducted a piece of research in the school to address exactly that, introducing peppermint and white sound after lunch so that we can actually introduce literacy and numeracy in the afternoon. And we were getting some interesting results on that. So then we've got uh, air pollution. Um, and again, something that is invisible that causes great problems. Um, we have products that produce benzenes, tetracyclines, and all sorts of things in the air that create, cause headaches. Um, we've got levels of CO2 that increase. We have monitors that we've actually used, and it's amazing, not many people use these monitors. CO2 levels, especially in the winter, when we close all of the doors and the windows, and we start to consume all of the space. It's amazing how quickly you get to the red alert on CO2. Amazingly, unfortunately, had NASA conduct a piece of research that sh showed how certain types of indoor plants hoover up and filter and clean the air. And amazingly, some actually absorb carbon monoxide. When I was thinking about carbon monoxide, I was thinking of all of the offices in London, lo offices that I've actually worked in that are below ground level. Carbon monoxide is heavy. It will sink. It will fill up ground spaces like swimming pools. And once it's in the blood, it's not a good thing to have. But uh, NASA and it's amazing what plants, they're things like Hawaiias, Scheffleras, really plants that you customarily see as indoor plants will actually start to do, filter some of the air. These are becoming more and more popular, love them. Uh, the wonderful thing about them is that they produce oxygen. They, they take on carbon dioxide. They also humidify the air, so they, some of the static, they re release some of the static that build up that sometimes happens between individuals and products. <coughs> they de-stress, they absorb some of the uh, noxious products. In fact, we've started using them in some of our outpatient departments as well. And here are some smart products, just to begin to address some of these things. This was uh, um, a friend of mine, he actually used it in one of his grand design houses. It's called a stove, it's, sto it's called stoves, and it absorbs smell. It's an amazing product. It, it really is, because that's one thing that you, you seldom recognize in your own office is the spell, because you live in it. It's your, your smell. It's amazing. Other people that come in will recognize a distinctive signature that your office has. This absorbs smells really amazingly. It's amazingly effective. Carpets, contrary to much belief, they actually hold it's wonderful research, and this is really very different to what we hear uh, in our hospitals where everything has to be hard surfaced, clean, and so on. 
what they discovered was as people walk through space, all of the dust and detritus becomes airborne, you breathe it in, and whereas carpets, certain carpets absorb it and hold it all of the time, and then it's released when it's cleaned and hoovered away. Interesting. A product from your own factory, and this decomposes a ceiling. We've gone from walls to floors, now to ceilings. Decomposes formaldehyde, which is amazing in itself, on the ceiling. I'll just move, <coughs> quick, I'll move really quickly through this. Taste, I can talk about taste because it, there are issues with taste and food. It's amazing that the most important meal of the day you have in the office and the people going around say, oh, it's for wimps, lunch is for wimps. <laughs> but it's also eating on a keyboard and all of the infection issues and so on that I could, we could talk about. Anyway, these are one or two design tools that I'll spin through that we've started to develop, which might interest you. Sensory plans, which we've started to produce. Have you ever heard of olfactory plans? We started to produce these, and, and it's wonderful when you start to commit that level of detail. But these plans begin to talk to one another, and they raise issues that you never knew you had. And this is quite a successful spreadsheet that we've developed, which is rather like a design prescription, but identifies the senses, the body systems, the, these are numbered pieces of research, effective research. So you go from depression to issues with sound and you will identify any number of pieces of research that relate to that particular environment. But it also deals with, in this instance, for instance, differential between, say, a clinician and a patient. And then you have this. <coughs> I'll just introduce this because it's, it's a fairly banal, but it's used in, the, uh, ho in hospitality, and I've seen it used in a hospital in Chicago, where it's a sensory audit tool where you literally go through the spaces. As I said, you're very familiar with your own environment and you get accustomed to it, but your clients come in, will smell something very different. You know, we know lavender does magnificence, magnificent things for productivity, but if you come into it, into the space, it really, it's, it's, it's fairly different to some of the musty smells that you can actually get in, in your, your own office space. And it's good to do an audit check, a regular audit check. So you have things like toilets, you have these things, food smells that come from the kitchen into your reception, which is, you know, your meeting. These are really important things, banal, but important. And these are some of the magnificent offices that exist. And there are several of them, things that, and you'll have obviously seen of Red Bull, which is here in London. There are one or two are in London. There's Google, there's Innocent Drinks, and so on. Uh, they're fun things. You're, you're obviously familiar with a number of them. But so, essentially, I'd just like to say that when designing spaces, think of all of the senses. The senses all talk to one another. There's amazing evidence-based research out there. Even if you picked one of those, you'll find that it was beneficial to productivity, you know, the active viva light, the temperature. Get one or two of these things talking to one another, and you can lift up well-being and productivity. Thank you very much.